Nasal cauterization with topical silver nitrate is a common and reliable intervention for the treatment of recurrent or active epistaxis. The release of silver ions forms an eschar that obstructs and sclerosis blood vessels. This video demonstrates the evaluation of a patient with recurrent epistaxis and the technique for performing nasal cauterization with silver nitrate in the office. Indications for nasal cauterization include active epistaxis or recurrent epistaxis that impacts a patient's quality of life or health. Adjunctive interventions may include direct compression of the nasal ala, the use of topical vasoconstrictors, nasal packing, and the application of moisturizing topical agents to the nasal mucosa. Nasal cauterization in the office should not be performed on patients who are unable to follow instructions or tolerate brief discomfort. Severe epistaxis can be a life-threatening emergency and should be managed in the emergency room rather than in the office. There are two types of epistaxis, anterior and posterior, distinguished by their respective blood supply. The anterior nasal cavity has a very rich blood supply and several vessels anastomose at a region of the anterior septum called Kieselbach's area or Kieselbach's plexus, including branches from the facial artery, the anterior ethmoidal artery, and the sphenopalatine artery. Most cases of anterior epistaxis involve this region. The mucosa overlying the vessels in the anterior nasal cavity is thin and sensitive to injury. Exposure to cold, dry air and recurrent trauma are common triggers of anterior nasal cavity bleeding. A deviated nasal septum can result in excessively turbulent airflow, which can further exacerbate mucosal trauma in the anterior nasal cavity. Topical silver nitrate cauterization is generally performed for anterior epistaxis. The lateral nasal wall, which is supplied primarily by the sphenopalatine artery, is often the source of posterior epistaxis. Posterior epistaxis generally requires nasal packing or surgery for control. Obtain a focused history from the patient, addressing the frequency, severity, location, and laterality of recent nosebleeds. It may be helpful to use commonly understood reference points by asking, for example, whether a nosebleed was severe enough to fill up a cup with blood. Ask the patient about a personal or family history of bleeding disorders, as well as other conditions that may predispose the patient to bleeding. Such conditions include recent surgery or trauma, use of anticoagulant or antiplatelet medications, use of intranasal medications or drugs, or potential causes of thrombocytopenia, such as recent chemotherapy. Very severe or frequent unilateral nosebleeds should arouse concern about a more serious condition. One possibility is a benign or malignant neoplasm, which may cause concurrent asymmetric symptoms, such as pain, nasal obstruction, rhinorrhea, double vision, or other cranial neuropathies. An unusually prolonged history of severe epistaxis should prompt concern about a diagnosis of hereditary hemorrhagic telangiectasia also known as HHT or Osler-Weber-Rondeau syndrome. Any such concerns warrant consultation with an otolaryngology specialist. Ask the patient to find a comfortable position in the examination chair. Then perform a complete examination of the head and neck. Facial asymmetry or cervical lymphadenopathy may be suggestive of a neoplasm. Hemotympanum may indicate that blood has refluxed through the eustachian tubes to the middle ear. Blood or a clot in the oropharynx may indicate active or recent bleeding. To evaluate the anterior nasal cavity, perform anterior rhinoscopy using a nasal speculum. Make sure that the lighting is adequate for visualization. To minimize patient discomfort, stabilize the nasal speculum by resting your index finger on the patient's nose. Then, carefully examine the bilateral vestibule, anterior septum, inferior turbinate, and the floor of the nasal cavity. If a nasal speculum is not available, the anterior nasal cavity can be examined by gently elevating the nasal tip. 
Note any prominent blood vessels in the mucosal surface. Gently remove scabs or crusts with a cotton-tipped applicator. Identify the entire length of each prominent vessel that may be the source of bleeding, including its proximal origin, which may be along the floor of the nasal cavity. Next, gather the necessary equipment for cauterization. Cotton balls, along with forceps if they are available, will be used to apply a topical anesthetic agent such as 4% lidocaine with or without a topical vasoconstrictor such as oxymetazoline. For cauterization, several applicators of topical silver nitrate should be at hand. Be prepared for the possibility of bleeding. Anterior epistaxis can usually be controlled by applying firm pressure to the nasal ala. Absorbable packing material, such as gelatin sponges and oxidized cellulose, can be used to control bleeding. Have suction available if possible in case of increased bleeding. With the patient positioned comfortably in the examination chair, place a cotton ball that has been soaked in 4% lidocaine with or without oxymetazoline in the anterior nasal cavity. After approximately 10 minutes, remove the cotton ball. Assess the level of anesthesia by touching the mucosa with an instrument or cotton-tipped applicator. In adequate lighting conditions, apply the silver nitrate to the mucosa around the prominent vasculature. For large vessels, it may help to apply the silver nitrate circumferentially around the vessel to limit its blood supply before targeting the vessel itself. When you are performing cauterization in Kieselbach's plexus, address the entire course of the vessel, including its proximal component along the floor of the anterior nasal cavity. Topical moisturizing agents, such as nasal saline gel, can be applied to the nasal cavity to protect the area as it heals and may soothe the burning sensation that can follow cauterization. If recurrent bleeding occurs, Topical vasoconstrictors can serve as a useful adjunct to compression. Analgesic drugs are not usually needed, but over-the-counter acetaminophen or non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs may be used if necessary. Bedside humidification, especially in dry winter months, may reduce the risk of recurrence.